Hello and welcome to today's webinar, The One-Two Punch for Digital Business, Converging Your Content and Processes. I'm Teresa Resick, the Director of Webinars here at AIM, and AIM is your host and producer of today's event. And with me today are Forrester Analyst Rob Koplowitz and David Janess from IBM. And IBM is the underwriter of today's webinar, and we thank them for their support. And thank you for taking the time to join us today. Before we get started, just wanted to share a few pointers with you for viewing today's webinar. By joining live, you can customize your own viewing experience, so feel free to open, close, or resize the different windows. Across the bottom of your screen is a list of all of the widgets that are available to you. And one of those is group chat. And just open that, open that group chat icon, and with that you'll be able to text communicate with each other and also with a few of us from here at AIM. Do ask questions of the speakers throughout the hour using the Q&A feature, and we will hold these questions until the end where we should have about five or ten minutes to answer them. You can also use this feature to ask for technical assistance. You may download a PDF of the presentation at any time. Just look to the resources list that's to the right of the slide area. And there are also a few other documents and links in there to help you learn more about today's topic. Just click in there at any time and the resource will open in a new browser tab and you can save it and read it after the webinar. At the end of this webinar, a brief survey will open in your browser and that's also in the widgets below in the slide area. We'd appreciate it if you would take a few moments to offer your feedback and to suggest other topics for us to cover. This webinar is being recorded and it will be posted to AIM.org's Resources Webinars page in just a few days. And now to introduce the speakers that we have with us today. Rob Koplowitz is a Vice President and Principal Anal Analyst at Forrester. Rob's research focuses on digital process automation as well as artificial intelligence and cognitive computing. He brings many years of experience in enterprise software consulting, product marketing, product management, and strategy. David Janess is a writer and public speaker who specializes in communicating the benefits of new technologies to business decision makers. At IBM, he develops the messaging strategy for the ECM division, while executive, um, writes executive, executive speeches and videos, and produces IBM live events. Prior to 2010, Mr. Janess performed a similar role with Capture Pioneer DataCap for 12 years. So right now, I'm going to th turn things over to Rob Koplowitz to begin our talk today. Rob? Thank you, Teresa, and thanks everybody for, for joining. I haven't had the opportunity to talk to the folks at AIM uh, for a long time because I've uh, moved on to different things. I used to do content and used to get to speak with y'all, and, and now that I'm a I'm a process guy. Um, you know, I guess uh, I guess it's, it's awfully nice of you to, to have me back. Um, and I think the timing is really good because I think um, while there has always been a deep interdependency between process and content, process in particular seems to be uh, in the throes of a rather significant uh, change, a rather significant transition. Process was always kind of, you know, the uncool. Uh, a step brother, you know, stepsister. Uh, you know, process was, was a little bit like kale and Brussels sprouts. It was something we we put up with. Um, but but things are changing now. Over the course of the last couple of years, things have really changed dramatically, and, and people are starting to realize that that kale and Brussels sprouts are power foods. They're great, and, and that process is really uh, in a very very important uh, ingredient and very important foundational capability. Uh, for digital transformation. So our clients are really struggling with this topic. So um, as you can imagine, Forster has uh, clients right across the board. We have new disruptive clients, uh, and we have some, you know, some very old established players who have dominated markets for, for many, many years. Uh, and, and these folks are really beginning to feel a lot of heat. Um, uh, particularly from those digital disruptors. These disruptors are able to do things faster, more effectively, and one of the things that they're really not encumbered by are things like legacy systems and organizational boundaries, all of the things that process systems are designed to help flatten out, help us traverse. So, so we find ourselves now with these clients that say, gosh, my, my, my 
competitor is able to do things so much more quickly, so much more efficiently, and create these delightful user experiences. We have to, we have to change. We have to become digitally transformed. And, and we, and we actually, to be completely honest, have seen a history of these digital transformation efforts failing. There's, there's a huge focus on front end and, well, if I just build a mobile app that's really great, then I'll be digitally transformed, right? But, but it's actually more complicated than that. This is a quote on the screen from a MIT Sloan Management Review document. And I do think MIT, I think, I think the Sloan School is just doing brilliant, brilliant work around, uh, around the topic of digital transformation. This is from 2015, but I continue to bring it up over and over again because it just still rings so true. And if you look at the first line, the power of a digital transformation strategy lies in its scope and objectives. Less digitally mature organizations tend to focus on individual technology and are decidedly operational in focus, and the mature organizations are looking at transforming their business. So it's a strategy, and it's a strategy that starts from the top. And that's really what you have to think about if you're going after digital transformation as relates to process. Every two years, we actually go out and, uh, and do a rather extensive survey of the process professionals, both Forrester clients and non-Forrester clients. And, and I think this one is really interesting. So this is, this is two years old. This is, um, this is the last version of the study. And I'm going to start digging a little bit into the new version of the study because we just pulled it back in from fields within the last day or so. And, and I crap. I grabbed a couple of significant data points out of that that I thought would be uh, relevant to the audience here. But in this one, and it's a little bit of an eye chart, we ask folks, what are your goals with association to process? And you can see things like cost reduction and productivity and customer experience uh, improvement and regulatory compliance and digital transformation. I'm going to go ahead and advance this and draw a line through one of these. And the nature of this study was we asked them, what were your priorities two years ago? What are your priorities today? And what are your priorities going to be two years from now? And, and so it's not technically trend data, although in the latest version, which we just brought in from field, we asked the exact same question so we can trend that. So look at cost reduction. Two years ago, cost reduction was a top driver. It was the main reason that folks were uh, involved in process application. Now look at it drop down to 7% as they project two years ahead. So cost reduction, which was generally what we'd use uh, to, to, to justify projects um, around the you know, traditional BPM space, is beginning to fall. It doesn't necessarily mean that people aren't still measuring cost reduction. As a matter of fact, we got the opportunity to do some really interesting um, research with IBM, and IBM actually has this paper available. Perfect timing for this, David. Um, they have this paper available, and, and within it, we asked folks specifically around process and digital transformation. And while the results really echo what we see here, what we found is they're actually still measuring cost reduction. So it doesn't go away. It's still important. It's just not the primary driver. I, I call this a little bit the, uh, the Prius effect. So, you know, if you ask people, why are you going in, why are you buying a Prius? Well, I want to reduce my carbon footprint, and I want to reduce dependency on former oil farm on, on foreign oil and you say how's all that going they say oh, i get 56 miles to the gallon it's what we know how to measure and we're really good at it and it's still very very relevant but look at this this is one that actually really caught our eye look at what people had with consideration to digital transformation two years ago and look at where they project two years out they projected 50 percent of their process applications are going to be focused on digital transformation two years out. Now, I mentioned we trended this data. Here's something really interesting we'll share with you, but I don't have available to show you. The new data looks exactly like the old data, which means we're still projecting the same things two years out that we were two years ago, which if you think about it, it means the goals remain the same and our progress to those goals haven't changed. So we're stuck in the mud. This is really hard things to do, folks. But but the shiny object of getting to digital transformation and using process to help you get there remains just as valid as it was two years ago. This is the new data. And I pulled a couple of things out of the new data just because I thought what was happening here was just too stark to ignore and to not share as quickly as possible. So forgive me that this slide is a little bit rough. 
Um, but, but I wanted to bring it to bear um, sooner rather than later. So this is on a topic of methodology. And we asked people about a whole bunch of different things within this methodology section. We asked them if, you know, are you, are you committed to using BPMN as a, as a notation standard? Are you committed to waterfall as a development methodology? Or are you moving towards agile? What are the roles of your six, Lean Six Sigmas within your organization? Are they an important part of driving your methodology? And on and on and on. We asked them specifically in this, type, in this instance if they were using customer journey mapping as one of their process mapping tools. Look at these numbers. If we ask them to project out over the next 24 months, 57% plan to increase the use of customer journey mapping as a way to drive process methodology. And an additional 27% plan to increase it significantly. If we go back a few years and you think about, you know, the folks who were in the back room, you know, running most of your complex process applications, BPM applications, they didn't know what the heck customer journey mapping was. They probably didn't care. So the drivers are really changing. Um, and, and again, it aligns back to that uh, digital transformation that folks are trying to get through. By the way, the other thing that changed, this is the other one that jumped out in terms of the data. How do you plan to change or expand process improvement technology in the next 24 months with regard to design thinking? We see similar types of numbers here. 56% plan to increase and 26% trend to increase dramatically. Again, let's think about what we used to do with BPM applications. They were back office. They drove efficiency. We didn't really care very much about the interface because we were putting in front of people that were paid to actually interact with that application for the most part. So with this shift in mind, about a year and a half ago, Forrester actually dropped the term BPM. We don't, we don't do a BPM wave anymore. We don't write research about BPM. We still write about all the underlying capabilities that are part of BPM, but we've switched our terminology to digital process automation. And there's a few things that are different with regard to digital process automation as regard to the old BPM. So, number one, it's fast. The days of spending six to 12 months understanding the process, another six to 12 months building the application and then rolling it out, still going to happen. But side by side with that, you have to be able to build applications quickly. You have to be, built, be able to build applications in weeks and in some instances, days, because the backlog of applications to get to digital transformation is fundamentally different. We're going to dive into that in just a minute. Number two, it has to delight users. So if you look at the Forrester Wave methodology, we're really holding people's feet to the fire. What is your mobile strategy? What is your form strategy? What do your applications look like to the end users? Why do we do this? Why do we place this big emphasis on it? Not a limited number of users anymore. Minimally, what used to be you know, dozens or hundreds of people using the application becomes probably the majority of your employee base touching it at some point in time. And increasingly, these things are being put directly in front of customers. Um, and, and, and that requires a very, very high bar in terms of the user interface and capabilities. Lastly, it's got to be innovative. If you're going to be putting these things in front of your customers, you have to be able to move at consumer level speed. So we put a big emphasis on things like voice interfaces, natural language processing, um, you know, uh, um, um, the ability to, to be out on the cutting edge around other parts of artificial intelligence. Um, and those are the three factors that we think are important. Now, how do these come together? We, we've actually kind of split the world in two, right? So, so everything on the left we refer to as deep applications, deep process applications. They're structured, they're methodical. There don't tend to be very many of them. When they're executed, it tends to be the IT group, the center of excellence, the businesses involved. They're all three working together. IT owns diligence. They own security. They own privacy. They make sure that any back-end system of record that, be, that is being touched uh, maintains integrity. They're thinking about things like compliance. There's a big focus on, on regulatory compliance in addition to cost reduction. That class of applications, are very much going to exist. They're still going to be mission critical in your organization, but they're going to be augmented by a new class of applications that are fast. There's a lot of them. The business is going to lead them. In many cases, the business is going to build them on their own. IT is going to be more in the business of guardrail, 
making sure that all the things that they have to ensure are guarded when these business application developers take a more take a more pronounced role in this. Uh, and the focus increasingly is on these end-to-end -end automations that drive better customer outcomes. I mentioned business people, and I mentioned business people specifically because if you're looking at that long tail of applications that you have to build to get to digital transformation, and just to put some numbers on this, when I talk to the you know to the Process Center of Excellence, you know they used to run you know you know somewhere between you know eight and twelve applications were on their plate in a large complex organization. Now they have backlogs of requests in the hundreds, growing into the thousands. And the more mature organizations, in terms of this process strategy, this digital process strategy, uh, digital process automation strategy, are actually now building well over a thousand applications uh, and doing it on a common process platform. So with that in mind, your business people are going to increasingly become part of the process. In some case, they're going to be developers. Why are they so important? They're the ones that are struggling to serve your customers. They're the ones that know that that spreadsheet that they email around is a fundamentally inefficient way. And by the way, when it's getting emailed around, the customer is not being served. They know those manual processes. They understand their role in the larger processes. Your, your process professionals, your Six Sigma, still play an incredibly important role in understanding the entire context and the strategy, but these folks understand their part of it. So why are we stuck? Let's look at what's killing us today. Why can't we just proceed the way we've always proceeded? Process has been around for a long time. There are some incredibly strong BPM vendors out there, but the way we used to build those applications was just fundamentally too slow. We had very constrained capacity. So if we look at this long tail of applications that we have to get to, this BT applications, this is what Forrester refers to as business technology applications, applications that are designed specifically to win, serve, and retain customers. Those have been underserved, and certainly those business-driven applications, which were often considered back office operational things, but touch the customer journey in some way, those were largely being ignored because of lack of capacity, lack of business knowledge, lack of process knowledge, and <clears throat> the old game of telephone. Tell us what to build. Let's say you win the lottery and they're going to build your application. Tell us what to build. <coughs> Inevitably, what comes back is wrong. The other reason we can't do this the way we've always done it, <coughs> capacity in terms of developers. Developers were a big part of the old way we built developed applications. Pardon me for the U.S. data for anybody that, that's outside the U.S., but Bureau of Labor Statistics <coughs> just has really strong data on this. We're going to be a half a million developers short in the next day, decade, decade if we keep doing things the old-fashioned way. <coughs> Excuse me, folks. I've got something stuck in my throat at the worst possible moment. But what's the solution? The solution is we're seeing this gap filled with a whole bunch of tools that allow you to still maintain integrity, still maintain consistency, fill that strategy towards getting towards digital transformation, and it tends to be low-code, repeatable <clears throat> applications. We see different types of uh, business process methodologies like rules engines coming into play here. Certainly RPA has taken a big part of this and helped us automate things that were fundamentally difficult to, to automate previously. Uh, and again, I mentioned this low-code thing where, app, where, where business people are able to solve their own problems within, guide, within guardrails. They can build their own application. They can automate their own process. They can potentially do something like an RPA process and deploy a robot to handle a previously manual process. This is what we think is going to fill this gap, and this is what our clients seem to think is the answer to filling this gap as well. But with that in mind, when we think about these types of solutions, there's a few things we have to continue to think about. This is not now let every department go out and build their own application and, and just let them go crazy, let a thousand flowers bloom, bloom. Let's revisit the, you know, the heydays of Access Databases and Lotus Notes and, and other things. And, and we have to do this with a strategy in mind. And, and whatever we put in place, it, it's still got to integrate with those systems of record, right? These processes touch your systems of record, and, and that's hard. That's hard to do. So you have to look at, 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 pro, at uh, solutions that can help you do that. It's got to handle complex, changing processes. So, you know, as we look at this with our clients and say, what do I use to actually solve this? Uh, and they start to look at, you know, the most basic situational, event-driven workflow application 
that's probably not going to get you there. What we're finding is, is the process requirements are actually quite a bit more complicated than the most basic low-code systems offer. It's somewhere in this middle ground that, 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 that we're seeing these, these types of relatively complex processes emerge. And again, there's a lot of them. You got to have insurance. You got to have governance. You got to have compliance. I didn't highlight it, but probably somebody out there noticed. You know, compliance is not high on the list of reasons for deploying process applications. I happen to be calling in from a hotel room in London. And guys, you know, compliance isn't going away. It's every bit as important as it ever has been. And if you're not thinking about GDPR as relates to your organization, you know, you need to. It's going to be really important, and the systems that you deploy have to be able to to handle all of that within uh, within the realm of governance and compliance. It's got to be secure. It's got to be private, and it's got to be a consistent approach that leverages skills and investments. So we're really asking our clients to look at doing this in a consistent way that's architecturally consistent that allows you to have consistent support to be able to provide consistent skills training for the people that are going to be touching these systems, and the list goes on. I want to shift gears for just a minute before I turn it back over to David and, and talk a little bit about um, our, our glimpse of the future. So I did leave uh, Forrester for about a year, a year and a half, almost two years. Uh, between content and process, I went to IBM and was working with some the Watson Technologies, working on embedding the Watson Technologies into the collaboration uh, work there. So uh, I'm, I'm also spending part of my time on AI, and I wanted to do some research on AI as relates to process. We basically found three patterns that we think are interesting where AI is being applied to process applications. So the first is new interfaces, natural language, the ability to talk to a computer. Sometimes it's going to be through voice, it's going to be through your you know, Alexa device in your kitchen, and sometimes it's going to be through something like a chat window, but it opens up new possibilities of interacting with process systems in places and by people that weren't able to do it before. The introduction of cognitive expertise from the outside, and things like fraud detection, and things like credit assessment, and things like health assessments and compliance regulation checking, there is an increasing number of external cognitive sources that can be applied directly within, uh, within a business process. And then lastly, automated process optimization. These processes are very, very complicated. They're very long running. And, and we've had analytics for a long time, but this new world actually applies that at the level of being able to show us root cause analysis as to why pro processes are breaking down and be able to give guidance to new users as to how to progress processes. So uh, I'll just leave you with a few thoughts here. So low code, no code around digital transformation. Recognize that your business people are the people that know your business best. They're the ones that are going to be able to help drive this through you, but they're not necessarily going to do it so willingly. Release that iron grip. Let your business partners become developers out there in the business, but do it in a way that makes it predictable and repeatable. And lastly, build a support organization to make that possible. So with that, what I want to do is turn it over to David and let David give you the perspective from IBM. Well, thank you very much, Rob. It is a pleasure to share the stage with you. And uh, what I wanted to do in my uh, few minutes here to, to uh, back end all this wonderful information that Rob has given us is um, two things. I want to uh, share a new announcement and uh, a new launch here at IBM, and then um, share some stories about where uh, this new set of capabilities is, is, is heading. And, and we're actually following some leading customers who've, who've converged process and, and content together already. And so I'll give you some examples there. So uh, first of all, I, I would think that the internal machinations of a software company are largely irrelevant to the end user, to the customer. But in this case, uh, I've got some news that I think is, is quite significant for, for customers. To set the stage and to, and to kind of continue what Rob has been talking about, let's just look at the traditional organizational structure of a, of a, you know, of a business. And, and this is generic, but of course they have, uh, you know, the R&D department and finance and legal and sales and marketing. And all of these uh, departments over time have uh, developed 
and or procured uh, their own business software solutions. These are point solutions. They're built for purpose within the, uh, you know, within each of the departments. And uh, often they have three-letter acronyms like ECM and CRM and uh, ERP. And uh, <clears throat> what's happening, though, and we're seeing it in ECM as well, uh, is the digital business is sort of forcing a blurring of the boundaries between divisions, between technologies, between the software, uh, between processes, uh, completely blurring them and creating this sort of new world that, that uh, and this has been happening for the last couple of years. So the digital business, which Rob has just done a great job of describing, uh, is really aimed at the customer. And of course, Forrester and, and, and their age of the customer have been uh, real leaders in, in educating the world and in, in how important the customer has become now to, to your success. And uh, here you can see now that you need to integrate technologies and infrastructure, integrate marketing, sales, and service into a single customer experience. You know, so the words here are integration, connecting, and collaborating in new ways. And so this is really the need. This is where the, the market is headed. This is where customers are, are, are moving to, and we need to be able to respond. Now, the last time I saw Rob uh, make a presentation, he had a slide in his deck, which I fell in love with, which actually suggests that I ought to get out of the house a little bit more. But uh, nonetheless, it sets up what I want to say so well that I recreated it, and uh, so with attribution, here's Rob's slide. And he talked about customer journeys, and what he said was, the customer journey doesn't respect these software categories. You're going to need ECM. You're going to need business process management. You're going to need robotic process automation, AI, cognitive, rules, decision management, and, of course, governance. All of these now are in play as you build digital business applications. So what has IBM done so that we can serve our customers and provide them with, with what they need in this new world? First thing that I want to tell you about is we forged a partnership with the leading robotic process automation vendor, Automation Anywhere. And so we are tightly integrating many of our products with the Automation Anywhere robotic process automation. Uh, and this was something we announced in September of 2017. What we announced in January is the convergence of two divisions, the Enterprise Content Management Division of IBM, which had such products as Case Manager, certainly the Capture, uh, Data Cap and FileNet Capture products, and the various content platforms. We have several of them. Uh, and, and we merged that with the Digital Process Automation Group, which had IBM BPM. They're the ones that had the relationship with Automation Anywhere, and they have something called Operational Decision Manager for business rules. And in January, we announced the creation of a new digital business automation platform. Okay, so this is internal machinations, but actually has a very important uh, benefit for our end users. So we end up with a market texture slide that looks something like this. Uh, what we're doing uh, as fast as possible is integrating all of these products from the two different divisions underneath a single unified user experience uh, and framework for building applications. And in the blue, you can see sort of the basic capability pillars, data capture, tasks is, is our robotic process automation pillar, content is our, our governance, our, e, our traditional ECM area, workflow, which could uh, cover the spectrum from straight through processing to, you know, very dynamic case management with a lot of exception handling, decisions. Uh, is, is the rules. And of course, analytics, because we're IBM, we have access to many different uh, elements within Watson and, and advanced analytics. Uh, many of our customers and business partners are 
are using them in, in different ways. In fact, some of the stories I want to share, uh, we'll give you some examples there. And of course, it has to be on cloud or hybrid or on premises. We need to be able to offer a lot of different deployment models. So, so here is this new world that uh, that reflects what we think is is happening in in the world around the world. What our customers is telling us is happening. And I want to take it one step further. The first thing you know when you start talking to audiences about automation, it, it's the elephant in the front row uh, is, hey, is this going to put me out of a job? Uh, that is often something that is uh, is a topic that we really should should address, and and it's it's you can see it in all of this discussion about robotics. Uh, but what's interesting here is that apparently, uh, you know, data shows, and I'm just quoting a Wall Street Journal article here, that this knowledge worker, the kind of folks who are using these tools, automation and, and, and content tools, are actually uh, a growing sector of, of the business. And uh, 1.9 million uh, per year being added to it. And so I have this uh, thesis that I want to put forth that we are actually creating a new job title. Now, every era creates its own job title. You didn't even have computer programmers till we had computers. We, you know, there's uh, a whole history of, of new jobs that are, are driven by technology. And I think right now we're seeing the emergence of, let's call it the wired worker. Now, the wired worker is increasingly decentralized, uh, but also, you know, technologically demanding. Uh, the new generation of folks who are joining the workforce right now have grown up with technology. They're used to it being easy to use, used to it being intuitive, easy to figure out, sometimes even fun. Um, and uh, so we need to keep that in mind. They need automation to extend their productivity, to do the rote, boring, repetitive stuff so that they can stay focused on the high-value stuff. Let the, you know, the transactional stuff, take care of that on your own, and let's save our attention and our time, you know, for the, the challenging human work. They need immediate access to relevant content and data to do their work based on their role, based on the problem they're trying to solve. They want to know uh, what's, what's the information about this customer to help me solve this problem, and I'm going to give you some great examples coming up. And that is certainly the great function that, that ECM has provided uh, over the years, is easy access, relevant content when needed. And then they need insight and, and even ne next best action. Um, and even tribal knowledge about how we have handled this particular situation before. We've, we've seen it 300 times. Uh, we've done this uh, 212 times, and it's worked out really well. That kind of information that can be, uh, you know, it can be uh, revealed through uh, analytics, it can be available uh, to help advise the wired worker in, in their process. So the, this new set of tools, which is certainly the result of the combination of process and, and content technologies and data management uh, and, and governance, all of these things uh, have helped create this, this new wired worker. So I want to give you some examples of what this wired worker looks like in several different industries and, and how these tools uh, can help. So the first we're going to look at is a European tax department. And like any tax department, uh, there are disputes. A citizen says, no, this is not the right uh, tax. I shouldn't be taxed on this. I have an issue with that. And so there is a, a way to uh, put in a dispute. And this tax department gets about four and a half million of these disputes per year. It used to be a very manual process. And what they did is essentially put together uh, the elements of our digital business automation platform. They did it before we announced this, but here it is in action. Uh, Capture is being used to bring in these uh, complaints or uh, documentation to support the dispute. Um, the rules are often uh, used to determine who and how these disputes should be handled and what priority to put them in. 
this is a super high priority, needs to be handled by a, a particular type of knowledge worker, that could be routed to that person. This one is pretty simple. We can let straight through processing handle it. So here you've got the rules driving it. And then along the, the right here, you can see there are different swim lanes to, uh, to handle the dispute based on its complexity or, or, or its requirements. And those really complicated ones, you'll see, will go to, to case manager where uh, a, a knowledge worker a, a trained on case can really get to and perhaps collaborate with others on the best resolution for that, that issue. Meanwhile, at the bottom, uh, all of the uh, activities and events and conversations are all captured and, uh, and stored in, in the content repository. So here you can see everything but robotic process automation, and of course they're, they're looking into that now, uh, yeah, but all, all here in action. And uh, some pretty cool benefits here before, uh, before putting this system together, they really couldn't process, uh, they had tons of people kind of working through it, and they had a lot of manual processes, and uh, they, they couldn't process a lot of disputes. Also, they had about 10,000 employees uh, that they needed to do it. They're, they're doing it now with about 2,700. So you're getting a lot more efficiency out of the system. Uh, as I say, letting the, the uh, automation handle those simple rote things and let the, uh, the complex ones go to the people that really know how to manage those things. So that's, that's a pretty cool little example of how the the entirety of the digital uh, business automation platform can be used. But let's take a look at another government uh, uh, example. And this one here in North America, there is a government agency that attracts and monitors every car and truck and, and motorcycle that is on the roads for safety. And if there is a recall needed, this is the agency that calls for that. So how do they monitor every truck and vehicle on the road? They're using a pretty interesting uh, combination with case manager being the framework, but a lot of different analytics and, and AI connected as well to uh, pull in content from many different sources, from uh, uh, customer surveys, from accident reports, police reports, repair bills from uh, uh, shops, uh, body shops and so forth, and, uh, and even social media people commenting, I love my car, I hate my car, or it did this, it did that. And so I think we have a sound issue here. Um, if you just give us a moment to uh, allow David Dines to get dialed back in here. I think we, he lost his sound connection. Apologies for that. Um, so tell you what, while we're waiting for David, to, yes, uh, Rob, if you can jump back in. Um, tell you what, I'm back, Teresa, me... yes. Oh. Was that David or Rob there? It, it's Rob, unfortunately. I don't know that David has no many left yet. So um, maybe we could take a look at some of the um, at some of the questions, uh, Teresa. We can sure, get a we sure. get a jump on those, and we'll hopefully we'll have David back here shortly. Um, anything that? Uh, yeah, I do have a question coming up. But just um, I know David's going to be talking about this. He had mentioned the Forrester white paper, and we have a link here. Um, I have it up on the screen right now, and then also it is in the resources section, and um, and, and so just wanted to mention that specifically here, and I want to keep this slide up while we go ahead and uh, take a couple of the questions that have come I've in. I've dialed back in, if you can hear me. Can you hear me? <laughs> we can. Welcome back. Well, <laughs> I apologize. Uh, it is somewhat of a miracle that Rob's in London, and I'm in New York, and you're in Washington, D.C., and we're all connected. So uh, uh, I do apologize. I think I was in the home stretch here, um, and I was uh, talking a little bit about yeah. Uh, the wired worker in the uh, yeah, in the, in the safety of automobiles. 
Yeah, some of your customer examples, and I'm not sure which slide you're on because these sort of look the same to me. Let's go here. Um, no, this is good. I want to I want to wrap it up, and I do apologize. Okay. Um, I wanted to give some different examples, Teresa, of how the wired worker can put together these different tools. So Blueprint Genetics is an example I'm pretty pleased with uh, as an example here because they're in the business of uh, providing DNA testing. And traditional DNA testing would take about uh, 30 days. And they said, well, look, what if you're waiting for results? Uh, from, uh, you know, for, for your health, and, and why would you wait 30 days? So they said, what can we do to, to, uh, to speed up that whole process? They got it down to 14 days, again, with case manager, with analytics, uh, being able to uh, crawl through. Often if they see a genetic mutation of some kind, they need to look up in the literature, they need to look up uh, uh, what, what different experts have, have been saying, uh, and, and so there's a lot of different uh, sources of data that they need to pull in together. And sometimes they need to collaborate with each other and find an expert that knows a particular uh, area. And so, again, this uh, automation uh, platform uh, within Case Manager gives them the tool to do that. Uh, another, I'm going to give you maybe two more examples. Actually, let me, let me go to this one because it's, uh, I've given you some uh, – sort of white-collar wired workers. Here's a blue-collar wired workers. Uh, you're, this is a uh, chemical company um, based in Europe, and they do a number of uh, metals. They work with all these different metals and chemicals. And when you mix together different chemicals, there can be different reactions. And they have a, a very uh, complex safety process before any procedure they need to check on the combinations of different metals and chemicals. And they used to have these safety cards. And it was actually a manual process. They'd have to go read a safety card on the combination of different chemicals. Now it's all on an iPad. Case manager uh, uh, gives them all the information they need on, on that particular combination. And often the, uh, the material, the safety information is updated on a regular basis. And so you don't have to go through this whole publishing process and so forth. Um, another good example of the wired worker is uh, a state human services department. And this state uh, didn't want us to use their name, but they happen to have many islands. <laughs> and on these uh, islands, uh, they would have different agencies. And so they, they were not connected. It was not a, uh, in any way, it was a, a siloed business, and it took days to get uh, paperwork in, and it took days to get uh, benefits approved. They've got that down to a matter of minutes now. So here, with the customer in mind, the automation uh, and the combination of capture and, and case and, uh, and content management gives uh, the ability to uh, to really respond better to the customers. And I think that's probably the best place to uh, end this particular section on, uh, on the customer, as Rob had set up. And, in fact, Rob mentioned a white paper uh, that Forrester developed for IBM, and you can read it by going to that second link, or you can uh, visit our website and learn a little bit more about this automation platform uh, that I just told you about. So I think with that, we can go to questions, Teresa. Sure, sure thing. And and I realize if you download a copy of the slides, David had a few more customer stories in there to share the application of everything that we've been talking about today. Feel free to reach out to him, and, and I'm um, sure that he will illuminate you on, on, on the, those different uh, and additional use case examples to help put that more into context. So um, I do want to get to this one question uh, to start with that did come in. And Rob, let me start with you. And, and David, feel free to join in here. Um, you had mentioned the need to provide that solid foundation you know, with the systems of record, handling the complex, complex processes, you know, governance, uh, compliance, security, privacy, all of those fun things we have to worry about in business. Um, your thoughts on bringing, this, bringing together that right team of stakeholders to pull it all off? Well, well, okay. So, you know, I mean, your 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 general cheesy analyst would just respond uh, that you need to uh, you need to build a working you need to build a working group that that covers all those areas. And uh, so, what I'm going to say is you need to build a working group to address all those areas. 
Um, and, and it's really, uh, th this is actually kind of front and center of, uh, pardon the cheesy joke, um, uh, of a lot of the work that we're doing. So, so look, we've done this before, right? We've done this around, around complex content applications and process applications. Um, you know, we understand the, the need to bring our security people in. We understand uh, the need to bring our librarians in so that we understand archiving capabilities, our compliance folks. Um, you know, in, in this instance, when we're starting to talk about things like opening the aperture of developers, you probably have to have, uh, you know, your architects and, and your folks who are in charge of system security making sure that the way that you're granting access to systems of record and under what circumstances and to whom, and are they reading, are they writing, um, probably need to be uh, involved. Certainly, you know, you want to do this again. We've been down this path before, we're building a lot of applications. Uh, we want to do this in a consistent, an architecturally consistent way that allows us to get to these to these end-to-end -end results. So, you know, you know, there, there's a lot of pushback that I'm getting when I say, you know, the, the, the role of the enterprise architect starts to come back into play, but but minimally. Minimally, let's, let's look at some of the different technologies that that you know David showed in that um, in that slide. Nice slide, by the way, David. Yours looks much better than mine. Um, and the fact that we have islands of technology experts within our within our organization. So, so not only do we have the discipline around security, around privacy, around compliance, HR probably needs to be uh, involved at some level. But we've got to break down the technology boundary. So, you know, as a process guy, one of the things that I'm hearing over and over again that's really disturbing is the rise of RPA. Not that the rise of RPA is disturbing. It's a, it's a very, very interesting technology that solves some problems in some very unique ways. It's the fact that they are separate from the content group, that they're separate from the process group. Uh, and, and so that we have people that are that are competing. You know, the, the arbitrary line between content and process has been uh, ha has been problematic enough. And now we have other technologies that are coming in. So whether it's decision management or RPA, we've got to pull these groups together and say, you know, we have to align to come up with an end to end outcome. I think it's gratifying that we're seeing all of this movement towards uh, towards customer journey. Because again, customer journey doesn't respect any of this. It doesn't respect technology boundaries. It doesn't respect organizational boundaries. And it requires you to think about this in a fundamentally different way. And we'll go back to slide one when, uh, you know, in the MIT Sloan um, uh, document on digital transformation that says you have to think about this strategically. So that was a mouthful. I think it ends up with a fundamentally different role for a center of excellence than what we've seen before. And I think actually, you know, whereas we had seen the old BPM Center of Excellence becoming less relevant, I think it needs to become something new, something different, part of something bigger, and it becomes far more relevant. David, anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, well, as uh, Rob was describing it, I said he's describing a center of excellence, and uh, indeed he came to that term at the end. And, and we're seeing, you know, with our large customers, they they started that process you know seven or eight years ago building this uh, this centralized process that brings together the stakeholders and be, begins to build uh, you know consensus about what's important what's priority and also can take advantage of shared services so uh, that that's a, a key point here so that you don't aren't recreating every uh, new application from scratch but able to reuse and repurpose uh, pieces. And, and, and so that, that center of excellence process, I think, is well established, and, and as Rob says, could could go a step further. I, I, I want to point out uh, a, a certain technology or set of capabilities that is, I think, essential here too, which is the modeling. Uh, and, and there's a lot of process modeling uh, solutions out there. IBM's is called BlueWorks Live where you uh, sit down with these group of stakeholders and begin to work out the process and and look for bottlenecks and run two or three different scenarios and see what the results might be and where issues might be. And I think all of that sort of virtual modeling before you actually even get started helps you evaluate do do we how do we automate this process? Should we automate it at all? Perhaps we should just eliminate that process and replace it with a different one and so forth. So these are all really important questions that need to be answered, and, and there are 
increasingly tools out there to help help visualize and, and, and get through that. So that would be my postscript to add to, to Rob. Okay. Um, I just wanted to mention a couple of extra things here. Um, we are counting down to AIM-18. It's just three and a half weeks away. And join us in San Antonio, Texas for our annual conference. And we have some exciting keynote speakers lined up, lots of great educational sessions, and as always, a lot of great roundtable discussions. Still plenty of time to register and make your travel plans. So for more information, go to aimconference.com. Also wanted to let you know that AIM offers live instructor-led training as well as online self-paced classes. You can thoroughly immerse yourself in deep dive courses or dip into a topic with a quick study offering. And we can even arrange for a trainer to come to your place of business and provide a custom perspective of our instructor-led programs. So all the information on this and the types of programs that we have available on a variety of different topics, that all can be found at aim.org slash training. And since we are at just about at the end of our webinar time today, um, just letting, reminding you that we have recorded this uh, presentation, and it's going to be available the next uh, day or two at aim.org um, at the resources webinars page. Don't forget the resources link to the right of the slide area. Also, to take the survey. Uh, I greatly value your feedback and appreciate the time that you take to complete those surveys. And very much want to thank our underwriter, IBM. Without the support from our solution providers, AIM wouldn't be able to bring you these free educational programs like our webinars. So thank you, IBM. Just as we bring this webinar to a close, I just want to leave you with our speaker's closing thoughts or a key takeaway from today. Um, just real briefly, and if we can touch on Rob Cockbullets um, from Forrester first, your closing thoughts. Um, yeah, I mean, what we, you know, what I would say to this audience is that, um, you know, there is, there's a wealth of information, there's a wealth of knowledge um, that you all bring to the table, and I think that we are in a really turbulent time in terms of what's going to happen as how this is organized, how they serve customers. You know, we're going to see strategic shifts, we're going to see technology shifts. Um, and, um, you know, your role in this, understanding process, understanding uh, content in the role of process, you know, certainly the diligence that, that AIM folks, you know, bring to everything they do is going to be incredibly important because, you know, when things shift and we have these kind of tectonic shifts in how companies do business, um, we step on our necktie a lot, and I think y'all are the net, are the experts in in, uh, in making sure we don't step on our neckties. So, thank you, Rob and David Dennis from IBM. Your closing thoughts today. Thank you. I like that image, Rob. Um, you know, this is certainly very interesting times. We um, had noticed that our own customers have begun to to merge their process and, and content domains internally. And uh, I, I think that, you know, it really underscores the, this trend and what this, this webcast is about today, uh, you know, and, and then why IBM has responded this way to, to provide the tools for uh, this kind of a convergence and, and, and this kind of a bigger picture, getting out of our uh, silos, getting out of our three-letter acronym uh, little worlds into the much bigger world of, of digital business. That's that, It really feels like we're right on the verge of something pretty cool. There's a, a lot of tools here, but our customers are telling us when they hear about this, this launch and, and this new platform that it's right on for what they need. So hopefully it, it merges with uh, your uh, thinking and, and the kind of uh, things that are, are going on with the, uh, the customers who joined us today. So thank thank you very much for the opportunity, Teresa, to uh, to tell everybody what we're doing. Thank you, David. And thank you, everyone, for your time today. For AIM, this is Teresa Resick, and we'll see you at our next webinar. And have a good afternoon. <laughs>